do well with his life. Brandon Fry. Good. Yep. I keep an idea for that name. All righty. He's, uh, I think he's on the Democratic, um, Young Democrats, or he's the vice president, maybe, of the Young Democrats or something like that. Wow. Oh, wow. But he's been teaching um, at different schools for the last four or five years. Uh, in D.C., of course. In D.C., uh, they were charter schools. Um, he's been going around to different ones. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, been, he's been doing really well. Uh, I tried to get him to come to Cadozo this year, but uh, if he'd have come to Cadozo, then he couldn't run. <laughs> yes, right. So he's taking Jack Jack's seat, right? He's right. Not, okay. Yeah. That's good news. Absolutely. Hmm. Marcus has arrived. Um, you want to start? decide to wait for the meeting, the, the hearing. Are you going to do a resolution? Okay, before? so Marcus is here, and LaJoy is here now. Okay, so where should we put Marcus? He's on the um, schedule after Angelo. Should we get started, Tina? Yeah. All right. All right, here we go. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I am Tina Bradshaw Smith, and I am flattered to be flattered and actually humbled to again be your moderator for the WTU series, hashtag only when it's safe. The format for today's session will be a round table entitled Share Your Story. If you were with us last week during our town hall, you will remember that we informed, educated, and empowered you through various testimonies from our DMV family explaining through science, not politics, that we can only return to in-person learning, hashtag only when it's safe. Today we will hear some personal stories from many volunteers who are concerned community members, educators, parents, and students about how they have or are dealing with COVID-19. Unfortunately, we will not be able to take any outside testimonies, but we do encourage you to share your stories on Twitter to the following, at Mayor Bowser, at DCPS Chancellor, and at WTU Teacher. Through, throughout this very important week of activities. I only have three housekeep housekeeping tips. One, we are asking you to mute yourself when someone else is talking. Two, we are asking you to unmute yourself when you are talking. And three, to share in the chat any, any comments that you may have. I now have the pleasure of introducing the president of the Washington Teachers Union, Elizabeth Davis, who will be bringing you greetings. Thank you, Tina. You're welcome. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today, uh, especially members of the organizing committee who put this event together. You've done an amazing job. Gladdy, Ben, Brittany, Laura, Steve, and others, and I'm, I'm, I'm free. Tina, uh, you've done an amazing job. And I actually had an opportunity to see some of the videos that were sent out, um, and I was absolutely amazed to hear the story of one teacher in particular. But I also um, want everyone to understand that I'm members of the lifeblood of this organization. And I'm excited to see them coming out on a Sunday again. 
uh, to share their stories mm -hmm. and raise their voices about the concerns that we are dealing with right now around COVID-19. And I want to thank everyone who shared their stories, amazing stories. Um, we've been sharing short snippets on our social media accounts, and these stories are so moving. I've actually had gotten calls from individuals who are not teachers who had an opportunity to see some of those stories. And I know it's hard um, for us, for everyone to share, especially with the fears that students and teachers are experiencing, but also parents. And I certainly want to get to the, hear more of those stories today. So I'm going to pass this back to Tina. I'm excited to hear more of them. And we are certainly going to be excited about sharing these stories with others, including the mayor, council members, and other members who, of our elected officials. So thank you for joining us today. And sit back and enjoy. Thank you. Tina? Thank you so much, Liz. Uh, today, we, as Liz said, uh, we are going to have some very, very moving stories. Our first one is coming from David Eiffel. He is a music teacher uh, for, with, with DCPS, and he just wants to share some of his health concerns and some of the concerns that he has about safety. David? All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, good afternoon, teachers and viewers, and thank you, WTU, for giving me a platform to share my story. My name is David Eiffel, and I am a DCPS teacher that has been an educator for over 14 years. I have asthma, and I'm taking medication for anxiety. Me, I'm terrified for the risk of getting COVID-19 or passing it along to my family. I would love nothing more than to go back to my music room and teach, but I do not want to be the sacrificial lamb for the school in school experiment. I hear so much about the kids development and the kids learning and our profession being put as glorified babysitters. When is someone gonna talk about the teachers? We matter too. We are not expendable. Most of our schools in DCPS are not ready for in-person teaching. There are not proper ventilation uh, systems, nor the proper PPE. Having a mask is not enough. Are we really expecting students to have their mask on completely for the entire day? Have you seen our students? We have issues with students going to the bathroom and having soap and not completely destroying the bathroom sometimes. Are we expecting elementary students to stay six feet apart at all times? Part of students' development is interaction and touching. Regulating that is not feasible. As for me, just like the parents have a choice, we teachers should have a choice too. And I am choosing my life and my safety above all else. If that means that I refuse to go back to the classroom, then so be it. Mayor Bowser and Chancellor Furby, you do not have to deal with teaching in front of students and risking your life and your families. As still, we have not been part of the conversation. A vague question on a survey does not count as listening, nor having a town hall that is more like a lecture than a town hall conversation. Do the right thing like all of the surrounding counties and invest in our virtual learning. Bring us back to school only when it's safe. Thank you. I have to give you snaps, give you props. Thank you so much, David. Um, our next presenter uh, is Angelo Parati. He is a fifth grade teacher at um, Eaton Elementary School. Angelo, are you ready? Yes, thank you. Go for it. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I teach at John Eaton Elementary. I'm a fifth grade teacher there. I am 59 years old and in reasonably good health. However, I do not believe that COVID-19 is a threat only to those with extraordinary circumstances, such as immunocompromised health or caring for an elderly parent. I believe it is a threat to every person in the United States right now. When I read about what this virus is doing to people, healthy people, young and old, I hear horror stories. And that is from the ones who have survived only to find their lungs or kidneys or mental abilities having suffered from their contact. And then of course, there are the deaths. Right now, our country is suffering from delusions. 
the delusion that we can control this virus, that we can win this war, that we can will ourselves back to some form of normality without actually doing any of the things we really need to do in order to fight it. As of this writing, the U.S. has over 4 million cases and are approaching 145,000 deaths. Two weeks from now, those numbers will be much, much higher. Our country is being devastated by a virus because of irresponsible leadership. We teachers can see this quite plainly because we know what a school or classroom looks like when the leadership isn't where it needs to be. Here are the questions I have in terms of DCPS and their hybrid plan. If we go back, how long before we are shut down again? What will DCPS do when teachers and students get sick? How many are enough to warrant shutting down? Isn't one too many? Will DCPS cover the health costs of every teacher who contracts COVID because of this return? The insidious nature of this disease demands that DCPS have valid detailed answers in place before they ask teachers and students to go back into the classroom. Every day we learn something about this virus that changes all we knew before, with two exceptions. It damages and it kills, only when it's safe. Thank you. I did the, I, look, I almost did mine. I did not mute myself as I was getting ready to talk. <laughs> Angelo, thank you. That was moving. Uh, and I was just, I just wrote down a couple of things that you were saying. And I remember I was watching CNN last night. And every time I watch, I look at the numbers. I look at the numbers. And then I start looking, and then I start doing my little basic math. The United States has one quarter of all the, all of the, the cases in the world. We have one quarter, one fourth of that. Come on, there's a problem. Thank you for that, for that wrenching, for that moving testimony from both David and from both, and Angelo. We will now have a testimony uh, from Julia D'Ambrosia Ambrosi, a major. She is an art teacher at Mann Elementary School. Uh, where I just saw Julia. There she is. My name is Julia and I'm a DCPS art teacher. DCPS is basing their claim that returning to school will be safe on the idea that we will restrict students to small cohorts, thus limiting their exposure to COVID-19. But the full reality of how the school day will operate means this plan is doomed to failure. Many kids take public transportation to school where they will share oxygen with hundreds of new strangers every day. Students who don't take public transportation will share a classroom with children who do. In response, DCPS has said they can't be responsible for what happens outside of their school. So let's talk about what happens in school. DCPS's hybrid plan has art teachers like me travel from classroom to classroom throughout the week. That means that I will be interacting with 300 students which is very low for an art teacher. If even a single student in my school gets COVID, then I will be exposed. And if I get COVID, I will expose all 300 students, their teachers and their parents. So much for the safety of cohorts. And art teachers will not be the only super spreaders. Music teachers, science teachers, librarians, principals, and vice principals will all be allowed to go from cohort to cohort. Others will too. Many people have noted that COVID positive children rarely display the same level of symptoms as adults. That does not mean they are safer. It means they are more dangerous. It turns every child into a potential typhoid Mary who spreads the disease to others for days or weeks without ever being identified. We now know from a study of 65,000 people that children over the age spread the virus as well as adults, and that children under 10 can and do spread it too. Children do spread the virus, and it's a deadly mistake to pretend that they don't. COVID has already killed 140,000 people in this country alone, and for every one person who dies from the disease, five or 10 more are left with debilitating heart, lung, kidney, and brain damage that will follow them for the rest of their lives. Is that the gift we want to give our children? Meanwhile, DCPS is asking teachers to simultaneously teach a cohort of students in person while also providing synchronous 
interactive online teaching to students at home. This is literally impossible. No teacher can be in two places at the same time, and yet this defiance of basic physics is what is being demanded of us. Just like the fantasy of self-contained cohorts, this plan is doomed to fail. The answer is clear. All the surrounding districts have already figured it out. We need to fully online teach this fall. We must spend the 11 million more required to ensure that each of our students has a computer at home, especially our most needy, and we must use the next few weeks to make online learning as good as it can be. Finally, I ask each of you to put yourselves into the mind of a young child whose mom or dad has just died of COVID, knowing that it was you who brought this disease home with you from school because your mask was too hot or you couldn't resist the urge to hug your friend or high five them. This is not a hypothetical scenario. This will happen if we reopen. No child should have to accidentally kill the people they love. Schools are places that connect us all, and normally that is a beautiful thing, but right now it is deadly. Thank you. Only when it's safe. Yes, I heard the clapping in the background, yes, yes. I, I tell you, yes, um, you can't be any more direct than that. And, and, and as one of the inner core teachers, I am health and physical education. You know, they tell us that, oh, yeah, y'all don't do anything anyway. You throw out the ball and keep on rolling. No, I interact with almost 250 students. I'm on the high school level. I'm on the high. All of us inner core people, we have the whole building. We have the whole building, you know, so, and they want us to move from class to class. I, I, I understand your point, Julia. Thank you so much for making that. Uh, we will have, we will now have Christian Herr, who is a sixth grade science teacher. So he's bringing in the science again. He's bringing <laughs> in the science to let us know what can happen and how it, how it will, this is his personal testimony. Christian. Uh, hey, hey, hey. Um, so I just finished my 11th year as a teacher. Um, in 2011, while grading papers during a planning period, I had a heart attack in my classroom. Um, I was 26. Um, my students saw me wheeled out of my room on a stretcher um, while they were transitioning between classes. Uh, I've gotten healthier since, um, but I see my doctors regularly. I take a lot of medication every day, and I probably will for the rest of my life. Um, my cardiologist has made it very clear that the risk of death from COVID is greater uh, for people with hearts like mine. Um, even if I were to catch and survive it, um, it's more likely that my heart would never be the same. Uh, more likely that I would lose years with my wife. Um, more likely that my students would again see me rolled out of my room on a stretcher, although this time I might not come back. Um, I understand that it's impossible to eliminate all risk. Uh, every time we walk out the door, there's risk. Um, I get that. Uh, but it falls on leadership on Mayor Bowser and uh, Chancellor Farabee, uh, in this case, to do everything they can to minimize risk. Uh, by refusing to engage actual educators uh, in the planning process and by pushing to reopen our school buildings while the pandemic is still very much raging, our leadership has failed us and lives like mine may be unnecessarily lost as a result. Uh, this is unacceptable. I love teaching. Um, it brings me more joy and more pride than anything I've ever done. Um, I'm really good at it. I'm at my best in my classroom, um, and I can't wait, I can't wait to get back to it. Uh, that being said, nothing is more important to me than my wife and my time with her. Um, I won't risk that. Time is the most precious thing that I have, uh, and I won't risk that time with my most precious person uh, until DCPS and Mayor Bowser come to the table um, so that we can collaboratively work together and ensure that our buildings open only when it's safe. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. That, you know, when you said that, everybody, I, I was watching, everybody was like, oh my God, you had a heart. That is, you know, and, and you look great. No, you don't need to go back. No. <laughs> 
because like you said it it's it, it's 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 foolhardy it's going to be foolhardy it you know thank you so much for that testimony uh mr bachelor you know i i i just overran overshot you very quickly didn't mean to but would you like to um just give us a, a testimony a brief testimony for those of you who do not know this is marcus bachelor he is uh, Vice President of the State School Board. Am I correct? Did I say? Yeah, State Board of Education. It used to be called the School Board. <laughs> and um, he is also a representative for Ward 8. Yeah, well, good, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much. Um, obviously, I just want to say first and foremost, I want to thank all of our educators who are dedicating yet another Sunday afternoon to organizing around this really important work. Um, I was happy to join you for your town hall last Sunday, uh, but also join you uh, last Monday for the caravan uh, when you took your message directly to the front doors of city leaders. Uh, and we need uh, more of that now than ever uh, to make sure that we're not only protecting your health and safety in the classroom, uh, but also protecting the safety of our, our students and young people. Uh, and obviously at the State Board of Education, we take very seriously our responsibility to amplify voices of our educators, students and families. And, and on that note, I wanna acknowledge also my, my War Four colleague, Frazier O'Leary, who not only is dedicating his uh, retirement from the classroom to this work on the State Board of Education, but is also dedicated for decades uh, to the children in our community. And so I wanna acknowledge him and I'm sure he has plenty to say a little later on. I'll just say very quickly, I wanna thank the, the members of WTU for showing up month after month uh, to State Board of Education meetings uh, to make your voice heard. We understand and are just as frustrated as you are that the administration has not included the voices of our educators when it's come to planning for a safe reopening. Uh, and uh, just like always on all pertinent issues, whether it's been teacher turnover, community schools, or, or this response to COVID, the, the State Board of Education has uh, made sure that we opened up uh, the dialogue with you and then worked overtime to amplify your voices. And so please stay tuned, please stay engaged with us. Know that we are gonna continue this conversation and push the administration to make sure that all of our educators are safe. Uh, and that uh, you get what we need, right? Which is, in my mind, three big things. One is information, uh, the second is time, and the third is resources. And what we realize is that the members of our union have gotten far too little of all of those things to make our families and our communities confident that we can open safely. Uh, and especially at, because I represent Ward 8, uh, and uh, represent about a quarter of school age children in this city, many of them black students and, and acknowledging the disproportionate impact that this uh, crisis has had on black communities. I'm extra protective uh, and extra cautious about the steps we take uh, to make sure that our students are, are safe, but also learning. So I'll be alongside you in this fight uh, to make sure that you get the voice you deserve, the resources and information, but that our students also get whatever they need as well to make sure we can start this school year. We're not done closing the digital divide. We are not done providing a quality healthcare network for black students in this city to make sure that they can be prepared to return. We're not done on, on a lot of big things that will prepare us to come out of this, not the same, but stronger and more equitable. Uh, and so I will be as, uh, alongside all of you fighting those fights. Uh, and, and again, you can count on, on me and my colleagues on the State Board of Education uh, as partners in this really important work. So I wanna uh, thank you for, for pausing to acknowledge me, but I'm um, really excited and, and more importantly, really focused on hearing the testimony of our educators today. So thanks so much. Well, thank you. And again, you were here last week. Uh, you were out there with us on Monday. I, I mean, you have been there with us just about at every action that we have had. I have to say between you and Mr. O'Leary, I know I've seen you every time. And I want to say thank you. And I think I see somebody in here who has braids in her hair that I, I didn't recognize the face. Because I'm like, wait a minute, she didn't have braids when, I, when she was elected. I, I, am I correct? Do I see Miss George in here, our newly elected Ward yes. 4? Yes, that's because, true. Because, because see, I'm here. I'm, here. I'm a Ward 4 person. Yes. 
Okay, grew up in Ward 4. That was me. Hello. Thanks. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. Would you like to give us a few words of just welcome? Because I did not see you early, so I just want to make sure that I do extend that to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to the Ward 4 um, educators who uh, already have testified. Um, and thank you um, for hosting this. Um, I have been present at the um, town hall that we had last Sunday. Um, also had the opportunity, uh, like Marcus, to join in um, on the caravan. Um, and I am just happy that you all are continuing to fight. Um, I always say, you know, for me, even in my race, I say, listen, if we don't, if we don't fight, we can't win. And so this is a fight that we all have to continue to engage in and not stop and bring that fight to the council every single uh, day that we, we are here because we're fighting for our families, we're fighting for our educators, we're fighting for our children. Um, and so I am here to listen and learn. I always say that you can't speak for the people if you're not listening to the people. And so I'm here because I want to speak for you. I want to advocate for you. I want to vote on a budget that reflects the value that I have for educators in our community. Um, and so I am here um, in, in, in a space to, to learn. Um, and I think you can't be a, a good leader if you're not willing to be a, to learn, especially from the educators who are uh, here in, in this community today. So I thank you uh, for the opportunity. These are my summer braids. <laughs> um, so, so. <laughs> I know, I, I know how it is. <laughs> you already know how it is. So. Yes, thank you so much. And I want to say thank you, especially to um, our Ward 4 uh, student board uh, of education representative Frazier O'Leary for the amazing work that he continues to do for our community. Well, thank you again. So, uh, and I now want to jump right back into our testimonies. Um, Kashira, I just said her name wrong. I know I did. Kashira Reed um, is going to, she's going to correct me. She is a pre-K teacher at School Without Walls at Francis Stevens. Did I say it correctly? You're fine. Long eye, Kashara. It's fine. Kishara, I apologize. As soon as I did it, I knew I was wrong. I apologize. Kashara, she has a lot to say. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Kashara Reed, a pre-K teacher, as she said, at School Without Walls. This was my experience with the flu in March, April of the 2018-19 school year. I had 20 children in my pre-K-4 class. Eight of them got the flu before me. <laughs> For the first time in 21 years of being in education, I too got the flu. My students were out about four days, but I was out for two weeks. The fever and aches went away, but the flu left me with respiratory issues. I had three trips to the urgent care, one trip to the ER, only to be sent home. One trip to my primary doctor, who then sent me straight to the ER again, where I was finally admitted. I have asthma, but had never been admitted or been on maintenance inhaler other than one bout with bronchitis. This time was different. I was hospitalized because nothing was keeping, was helping me to breathe better. Not steroids, not three additional asthma medications, not albuterol every four hours. Nothing was working. It baffled the doctors and other specialists. Pulmonologists, ENT pictures down my nose and throat, CT scan and x-rays revealing nothing, yet they could hear the rattle whenever I tried to talk and walk small distances and uncontrollable coughing. After different medication uh, cocktails, I finally had relief. However, the struggle was not over. My lungs consistently went down in, fun in function level for months after. I am better now, but my points or questions are, I'm African American with asthma. Does my life matter? If the seasonal flu could do this, what more can COVID do? I am still on a maintenance um, inhaler to this day. Students are often medicated with fever reducing medicines when they are dropped off. At home, I have a senior, a son with asthma, and a husband with a compromised immune system. How can any form of reopening in person be done without risking almost my entire household? Yeah. Reopening guidelines are, are also going against the normal nature of preschoolers, i.e. understanding personal space. They don't understand that, let alone, um, they can't do social distancing, let alone personal space. 
it does go, it goes against their learning objectives, making friends, managing feelings, interact with peers, engage with the trusted adult. How would they trust us if we can't even get close to them? They will jump on their teachers on their first day back. These conditions will stunt their emotional growth, therefore their academic growth, hindering our very goal, which is to educate and give them a help to a great start to their school career. What about the trauma that the teachers are facing and support during this time that we aren't even getting now? Will, trauma, will we have trauma support for ourselves then? Pre-K teachers often go home with remnants of all kinds of bodily fluids on their clothes. Lastly, stop acting like children and teachers are not dying from this. Can you sleep at night knowing your decision killed someone? Are you prepared to look those parents in the eye? The pain of bearing a child is a pain that never ends. Grief of not just immediate loss, but of those things that will never happen. Can you sleep with that? I urge you to open only when it's safe. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm okay. Kashara, thank you. I was at the um, at, at the car, car caravan last Monday. Kashara came up and she started speaking, and I got goosebumps as soon as she started talking. I got goosebumps, and I said, "We got to get her in here to do this," because everybody did not hear your testimony. Everyone needs to hear it. We all know what can happen. We know what can happen. I saw, um, Marjorie, you said eighth graders also, they don't know how to distance. They don't know how to social distance. Guess what? Neither do the high school kids. They really don't. It happens from pre-K all the way up. And they want us to open. And they want us to be in there. That's hard. We next have um, a video. By Aunt, from Anna Ramsey. She is a DCPS ELL teacher. Um, she's going to tell her personal account of COVID. And then Katie is going to read an update. Liz Davis, Chancellor Farabee. My name is Anna. And I am a 34 year old teacher with DC Public Schools, and I currently have coronavirus. Um, I know that right now y'all are trying to make a very big decision on how children will return to school in the fall. Uh, I know that at the forefront of your mind is the well being of our, of our children. And as educators, we understand that. Children right now, many children are experiencing challenging home lives. We understand that some children have fallen behind and we recognize that this is, is heartbreaking. It's very heartbreaking. Um, as educators, we want to go back to school in a manner that is safe. We want to welcome our children into our arms and nurture them and educate them because they deserve it and because it's our future as well. Um, so I thought today that I would share with you my current reality of having coronavirus. Um, I have tested positive and um, like I mentioned, I'm 34 years old. I don't have any pre-existing conditions. Uh, this virus is wild. This virus is a beast. And um, the symptoms vary for me. I have extreme fatigue. I'm tired. I, my dog was with me and she has had to go stay with my sister because walking my dog is exhausting. I also have body aches and it feels like my blood is boiling. Um, my hands and my joints and my feet feel arthritic. I don't feel 34, I feel 74. Um, last night I woke up at 1130 from the pain of the body aches of this like boiling blood. Um, and I had already had Tylenol in my system and it wasn't time to take any more. So I laid in bed and I listened to music to take my mind off of the pain. Um, 
another symptom that I have, um, well, I have nausea and I have headaches. The nausea can come and go very quickly. Headaches, there's two kind. One where my head hurts so badly, I think it's gonna blow through my skull. Another one, my headache is at the front and hot pain radiates down. Uh, I have two kinds of chest pain. One kind is uh, I feel like I have hot sand in my chest and it's just sitting there. Uh, the thing with coronavirus is we don't know uh, what our symptoms will be in the next few hours, much less the next day. It's so unpredictable. Um, and so right now I'm lucky that it's just hot and I've got some congestion and I'm lucky that it's not quicksand where I can't breathe. Um, the, the other symptom that I have involving my chest is I feel like my chest is, or my lungs are like voodoo dolls and they get just picked by the needle every now and then. It comes and goes, I don't know when, um, but it's there. So those are our symptoms. And uh, I, it's crazy for me to say that I believe this is mild because my oxygen levels are fine, they're normal, and I don't have a fever. And I believe that I will make it through this, but as we all know, not everyone does. And so I'm at home and I am fighting this virus. So my question for y'all is, how will you fight to ensure that students and educators can learn and grow safely in the fall. How can you fight to ensure that my current reality doesn't become the reality of my coworkers? That it doesn't become the reality of my coworkers who have pre-existing conditions or for my coworker who's overcoming cancer? I hope that y'all come up with a, with a solution to keep everyone safe I know it's not an easy decision. And as you make this decision, I hope that you will keep me and my symptoms in mind and remember that I am lucky. And what, am I ex what I'm experience experiencing right now is mild. This update is from Anna Ramsey. I want to thank you for sharing my video testimony. I want to thank my colleague, Katie Norton, for reading this follow-up testimony on my behalf. Today marks the ninth day since I've tested positive. Coronavirus has taken its toll on me physically and mentally. The unknowns of, of what each day holds and the development of new symptoms can be terrifying. Not knowing the long-term impacts of COVID on my body is anxiety provoking. Over these past nine days, I've also had concerns for my family and their well-being as I exposed them because I didn't know I was positive. One of my family members has tested positive and luckily has yet to have symptoms. Another family member tested negative but has mild congestion. The reason I cannot testify in person today is because I'm on bed rest and I've been advised not to talk for three to five days in order to conserve my energy for healing. As you are aware, I am 34 years old and have no underlying health conditions. I am an active person, a non-smoker, and I rarely drink alcohol. The day after I made my video testimony for Chancellor Farabee and Elizabeth Davis, I went to the ER for extreme fatigue, a terrible headache, and shortness of breath when taking when talking along with a rapid heart rate and sweaty palms. Luckily and shockingly, <clears throat> my vitals were excellent and my chest x-ray was clear. My blood oxygen saturation levels were at 99 to 100%. The doctor believes I am currently in the worst part of this virus and because my heart is so exhausted from fighting it, talking, a form of exertion, is too much for me which makes me out of breath and elevates my heart rate. We all know this virus has killed 140,000 people. We know it affects people differently. I was shocked and saddened by my diagnosis, especially because I put the people I love most at risk. Please know that I am not a fan of attention, 
but I feel compelled to tell my story in the hopes that it will positively influence leaders to open schools in the safest way positive until our country can slow the spread of this beast. We must have a collective consciousness to slow the spread. On Friday, July 24th, Mayor Bowser reminded us the importance of protecting vulnerable populations from this virus. I believe that going back to school in person will expose our vulnerable teachers to this nasty virus. This virus is highly contagious and it spreads easily. DCPS must take care of its teachers because without us, there will be no learning. Anna Ramsey. All I can do is just take a deep breath. That's all we can do. The reality is there. Anna just gave it to us. I'm now going to read um, another colleague. Her name is Jessica. I am in my mid 30s and newly pregnant with my first child. Already, COVID has dramatically affected my life and how I envision both my summer and my first pregnancy to be. I am panicked about walking my dog, walking by people in my apartment hallway, and eating food that's delivered, by, that's delivered to my door. I haven't been in a grocery store since March and do not see my friends or family. I am panicked about going to the doctor, something I very much need to do regardless of the stress it causes. My partner cannot attend any doctor's appointments with me. I have worked for DCPS for six years. I've stayed out. I have stayed out of, I, I've stayed out of a commitment to my school, parents, community, my beliefs, and, and my beliefs in this work, I apologize. We talk of, with talk of, school reopening in person this semester, I'm terrified for a variety of reasons. I've decided with the support of my doctor that I cannot return to the classroom for the health and safety of both myself and my baby. As I see it then, my hypothetical options are, one, use FMLA with no solid answers from anyone on whether I would qualify for disability and draw a salary, or whether using FMLA in the fall will prohibit me from using it once the baby is born. Uh, number two, I use up all of my leave with none left, after the, none left to take after the baby is born. Number three, I negotiate with the principal and the district and use the Disability Act or Pregnancy Fairness Acts to somehow allow me to work virtually. Or number four, I'm forced to take a leave of absence or quit my job if none of the above options are available. Losing, most, losing my health insurance, which is obviously most critical. None of these things are assured. I have no idea what the prob probability of receiving FMLA would be and imagine there's an, an even slighter chance of qualifying for disability and thus receiving a paycheck. I have no idea what would make the decision about my being allowed to teach virtually from home nor how to even begin that conversation. Further, I didn't, I, I'd, be forced to have to take to um, have that conversation with my principal during my first trimester. Another stressor that I don't need as I am already high risk because of my age. For the past week, we have been waiting to see what decision Mayor Bowser will, will take, one of science or politics. I have been asking my partner unanswerable questions daily stressing me out even further. The stress and anxiety of in, are indescribable. To know the choices that will be made for me 
by someone else affect my life in every single way imaginable. I beg you, Mayor Bowser, to do the right thing and not make anyone but particularly those who are pregnant or at higher health risk, make the choice between a paycheck and their lives. It has to sink in. I hope, and I saw a couple of comments, I hope that Mayor Bowser gets this. I hope she sees it. Our next, our next, um, teacher, no, no, excuse me, no, we have a student from Dunbar Senior High School, Armand Cuevas. Did I say that correctly? Uh, Cuevas, and I, I'm a teacher, I'm not a student. I apologize, it, <laughs> it did say teacher. I did say it right at first, but you know what happened? I apologize. Um, Armand looks like he's about 15. <laughs> 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 so, uh, yeah, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> you good, you good. Thank you. All right, um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Armand Cuevas. I'm currently a high school math teacher at Dunbar High School here at DCPS. Um, as COVID has severely affected many of our students and communities, I urge DCPS to stay closed and re return to physical learning only when it's safe. Personally, I contracted COVID myself at the end of March, and I was lucky to fully recover and not have any severe issues. Also, schools were already closed by then, so I was able to quarantine safely while still doing my job in distance learning to the extent that I was comfortable with. Although distance learning was tough for me as a teacher and for my students and families, it is the lesser of two evils because the risk of opening schools puts everyone in danger. Uh, the US and DC slash DMV area have not shown themselves capable of dealing with this pandemic compared to other countries. So for the sake of harm reduction, schools shouldn't open because our cases continue to rise Mm -hmm. um, furthermore, black and brown communities are hit the hardest for various reasons. Opening up schools, especially my school, further puts my families and my communities at risk. Teachers, staff, and kids can get sick and bring it back to their homes. Our communities are not guinea pigs. Our test scores are not as important as our lives. Yes, our schools are great places and staff and kids miss the school building and the in-person learning, but it's, it's not worth it. We need to focus on harm reduction. Also, DCPS is suggesting we do a mix of in-person and virtual. This is not just more dangerous, as previously stated, but also extremely inefficient. As multitasking is deemed inefficient, teachers and staff have to deal with teaching virtually and then teaching in person. And you're gonna have some students who are not gonna to come to school at all. And you have some students who are gonna to come to school and do nothing at home. And it's just gonna be bad for everybody. So rather, than, rather, we should force everyone to do virtual as we did in the spring. And if we commit to it, we'll, we'll produce higher quality virtual teaching and less logistical confusion. Um, personally, I've been able to stay flexible with distance learning, and so have some of our students. I have some students who are lucky enough to get resources and were able to do a really good job with distance learning. However, we have a clear technology divide. So the money we save from keeping schools closed, so operational costs, security guards, et cetera, we can use that money to divert it to technology along with other numerous ways that we can get funding. If we commit to virtual learning and put in the resources, I believe that we can be successful while also avoiding the dangers and logistical complications of in-person learning, only when it's safe. Only when it's safe. Only when it's safe. Now, we do have a student and she wanted me to make sure that I said this when I introduced her. Uh, this is Dylan Forrester. She is the daughter of Deanna Forrester. I saw Dylan. Hi, I'm right here. Oh, here you are. Okay. Okay, I'll put on my camera. Okay. Um, <laughs> hi. hi. Hi, my name. Oh, oh, okay, I'll start. Hi, my name is Dylan Forrester. I live in Ward 7. I'm a, I'm a seventh grader at Rose L. Hardy Middle School. On Friday, March 13th, I turned 12 years old. My birthday was the last day I was able to physically attend um, school. My first year of middle school came to a halt due to the coronavirus pandemic. From then on, I had to continue my sixth grade year on a desk in my bedroom. These past few months, the, um, the normacy of, these past few months, I missed the normacy of waking up at 
in the morning to make an hour commute to school and entering, to, entering the halls of my locker room to talk to my friends and see what's new and who's doing, I see what's new and what's the drama and who's doing what over the weekend. Since these past few months of distance learning, my days consisted of waking up and logging on to Zoom so I can start my day off going to my five classes that all last an hour. Although this routine can be very boring, I have learned that I am extremely privileged to have access to computer and internet. My mom also makes sure I'm comfortable and tries to find ways for me to have fun at home. Some of my classmates do, don't attend as often as, I mean as often, and I know they struggle to keep up. I feel bad for them. My mom told me that some parents have to go to work and can help their kids as much as she helps me. I miss doing normal things. It's hard, and it's, it gets hard and sad sometimes, but I know we have to be safe. I was looking forward to trying out for soccer this year and making new friends. I even miss my teachers. I believe at the beginning of our school year, DCPS schools should continue with distance learning for the safety of teachers, students, and family members with underlying conditions, and we should return to school only when it's safe. Out of the mouths of babes. Yes, you can all unmute and give her a hand for that one. <laughs> yes. Awesome, Dylan. Yes. Thank well you. Done. much, Dylan. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Say hello to your mom, Dylan. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent job, sweetheart. I, 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 I couldn't say it any better. I couldn't say it any better. You know, everyone says, well, you know, teachers are always saying this. Teachers are always saying this. Here's our baby. She just said it for us. Uh, our, next, our next person that we have, I know I saw her. Uh, LaJoy Law is a Ward 8 parent. I know I just saw her. I, I just saw her name pop up. Um, are we, LaJoy, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. There we go. Yes. Hey. Hey everybody, how y'all doing? Thank you so much um, for having me. You see my god mom in the background. So, hey god mom. Um, can, I, can I go? Is it, can, is it my turn? It's on you, yes. It's on me, okay, all right. Um, Thank you. Yes, first of all, happy Sunday everyone. I am um, absolutely honored and humbled to, to be able to share my story um, before you today and I just thank you all so much. But um, I'm here as a disability advocate, but most of all, I'm here as a mother um, and to share the story of my daughter. Um, my daughter, Abria, um, she is my miracle baby. So my daughter was born at 23 weeks. So she was one pound and six ounces. Um, and she is diagnosed with chronic lung disease and epilepsy. So she has multiple disabilities. Um, she is an absolute miracle. But um, I wasn't sure if I was going to share this story with you all, but I think I need to because of the magnitude of the situation. I remember one time I was in the hospital with Abria, and um, she, had a, she had a respiratory virus. And she was in the hospital for about two and a half weeks. And the pulmonary doctors told me, they said, Miss Law, you know, we, we just don't think she's going to make it. You know, she was just born so early, and we don't, we don't think she's going to make it. And they told me to get my affairs in order for her. And I started, I started, um, I started funeral planning for my daughter. I don't know if anyone knows what it's like to plan a funeral for a child, but I thought my child was, I thought she, I didn't think she would be here. So it's a blessing that my daughter is even here with me. I'm not gonna plan another funeral for my daughter. Mm -mm. And we don't need to be planning another funeral for any of our teachers, any of our parents or any of our kids. One life lost is too many. We can't lose anybody else. That's right. This is beyond ridiculous. No one should be going back right now. We have to think creative. We have to be there for families. We have to be there for our children. What about our children with disabilities, with underlying health conditions? I don't even take my daughter to the, to the grocery store. How am I supposed to take her to school? 
Hmm. And what about all the other students? So do we all want to get back to school? Do, what, do I want to be there? Does my daughter want to be there? We do. But I'm not planning another funeral. And I will send her back only when it's safe. Period. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you all. Thank you. Yes, for sharing that. I'm sorry. <laughs> that one hit me. Um, I was there one time. They told me that for my oldest child. Ooh, moving on. I have to move on. Jamie. Jamie Wolf is another early um, childhood teacher. Um, I have many friends that are child early childhood. And I I I truly, truly I, I, I just worship the ground that they walk on because they really have it hard. I thought I had it hard on the high school level, but they have it hard because they have those that they, they're trying to get them together so that they can get to me. And um, Jamie is going to talk to us, just give us uh, some brief information about how it's, been, how it's been undergoing treatment for cancer during this pandemic. Understand, we don't want to cry. We don't, you know, we don't want that, but we want you to understand. People go through a lot of different, a lot of different situations. Jamie, are you ready? I'm ready. Thank you, Tina. You're welcome. Um, good afternoon, WTU leadership, fellow educators, school-based personnel, community members, and DCPS families. These days, school leaders, teachers, and caregivers across the United States find ourselves staring down the uncertainty of a back-to-school season, the likes of which we have never encountered in our lifetimes. We are confronted by the proverbial Morton's Fork, which threatens to damn us if we do and damn us if we don't reopen schools this fall. Educators like myself want nothing more than to return to school and resume doing what we love, teaching our incredible, inspiring students, yet only when it is safe to do so. Right now, it does not feel safe, especially for people like me. The same day that DCPS closed its schools due to COVID, I was diagnosed with cancer. In one swift, fell swoop, I was stripped of any semblance of normalcy in my life. Cancer in the time of coronavirus means that in April, I was one of the last patients to have surgery to remove a tumor in my body. I can neither have friends nor family comfort me during hours long chemotherapy sessions. I feel that every time I leave the house, even though I responsibly suit up and follow all safety protocols, I am nonetheless exposing myself to a novel virus wholly indifferent to my current immune compromised state. My current reality is such that if I contract COVID, there's a very high likelihood that I will die. Four months ago, educators across this country were celebrated as heroes as we flipped traditional in-class learning on a dime to provide meaningful virtual instruction while only having one week's notice and inadequate school funding. Now, some of those same people who lauded teachers now denigrate us as villains, as though we are the ones solely responsible for the impossible quandary in which school districts find themselves. How dare we deign to suggest reopening our schools only when it is safe? For educators like me who are fighting cancer, or for those who have other pre-existing medical conditions or live with family members who do, we are expressly told our only option is to take unpaid leave. No one, should ever be forced to choose between their livelihood and their life. We must only reopen DCPS schools when it is safe. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. And you are a blessing. Thank you. And you look great. Thank you. I have to tell you, you you look wonderful. Thank you. I, 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 all of the, all of these testimonies are gripping every last one of them, but we have to understand we're not going to do anything until it's safe only when it's safe. Our last presenter, our last um, testimony that we have today is um, Ms. Sharita McArthur, Award 8 teacher. Hey, Marcus. <laughs> um, she's going to just give us some information and how it feels to be an asthmatic during this time. And I know I just saw her. Sarita, Sarita, there you are. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Sarita MacArthur and I am a Ward 8, soon to be Ward 4 elementary educator. Our concerns regarding the reopening of schools before it's safe based on DCPS's failure to properly fund and staff schools pre-pandemic and my chronic lung condition. I cannot say with certainty that DCPS will make the monetary investment necessary to ensure the safety of our kids our children and staff because there has never been enough soap, paper towels, trash bags, custodial and nursing staff, teachers, paras, and funds to ensure the sanitation and proper staffing of our buildings. Our custodians work tirelessly to ensure our buildings are clean with the limited supplies their budget allows. Our business managers will stretch a penny as far as it can go, but ultimately the funds come from DCPS. How can we trust them now when it is evident that we are not high on their list of priorities? Walk into a Ward 5, 7, or 8 school. Look at the crumbling walls, mouse droppings, cockroach carcasses. Open that AC window unit or HVAC system. Look at the size of the building against the number of custodians responsible for cleaning it based on the recommendations from the CDC. And then picture our children in this space. This is the environment educators must teach in and our students whom we adore learn in. Reopen our schools when you can provide evidence that this environment will no longer be accepted for our children. I could go into how debil debilitating an asthma attack is and how having it has caused my anxiety to go through the roof as my brain ventured down that dark road of what could happen. Instead, I'll tell you that at 12, I was hospitalized due to the collapse of air sacs in my lungs. During the winter of 2017, I developed pneumonia. Can't tell you how it happened, but it did. And if I had kept pushing through, not feeling just right, as many of my colleagues do, I could be dead today. Now the leaders of DCPS are asking me and my students who also suffer from chronic conditions and compromised immune systems to step into our schools without a comprehensive plan, receipts of purchase testing and PPE equipment and additional staff. This is not how you safely reopen a school. I look forward to the day that I can hug my 13 month old niece and two year old nephew again. I look forward to the moment when I am not scared that my mother who has battled stomach cancer, <sighs> We're here. We're here for you. Whew. And non-Hodgkin's lymphoma <laughs> can move safely through this world. I cannot wait to sit in a restaurant on a Friday with my teacher friends. I can't wait until I no longer have to measure the distance between myself and a, and a student in need of a hug. But I'd rather wait until it's safe than to tell the student, their classmate, their teacher, favorite lunch lady or principal has died because we reopen too soon. Reopen schools only when it's safe. Thank you. Thank you, Sharita. Thank you, Sarita. It, ladies and gentlemen, do you see, do you see the passion? We love our babies. We love them, but we love ourselves. But we're being penalized because we love both. 
because we love both, we're going to be penalized. We don't want that to happen. There are going to be some actions this week. Please be in tune with them. We want the mayor to know. We want her to know. Here's our week of action. Um, Monday, call the chancellor, email, email the mayor and chancellor. It's on the screen if you don't see it. Uh, Tuesday, wall of stories, speaking truth to power, reading of stories that we just heard and others that we have not heard. On Wednesday, we're having a car, another car caravan. Um, on Thursday, a mock classroom. And on Friday, the day that the mayor said that she was going to let us know whether we will be full virtual or whether we will have a hybrid learning environment, we need to be at that press conference outside that, that building, letting her know we're not going to stand here and take it. We have just heard some gripping testimonies from various sectors of our of, of DC. Um, now we have to tell the mayor uh, to make the wisest decision for DCPS. Allow us to stay home and teach our students virtually for at least the first semester. Here is a reminder. We have the week of action. Let's do it. The, Congressman John Lewis has said it and he keeps on saying it. He's saying it in depth. Ladies and gentlemen, we got to continue to get in some good trouble. Pick a day and let's go for it. Share your story. Use Twitter and send them and, and, and send your tweets to the following addresses. Mayor, at Mayor Bowser, at DCPS, Chancellor, and at WTU teacher. I want to thank you for sharing your stories today. We will now have closing remarks from our president, Liz Davis. Thank you, Tina. And um, on Friday, the mayor has nowhere to go but 100% distance learning, even before these stories, which are compelling. The surrounding jurisdictions, opening 100% virtually. Mm -hmm. Cases spiking in 35 states, including DC. On Tuesday, 85 cases reported in one day in DC. So if the mayor and chancellor are truly following science and not the political pressure that's coming from wherever, she has no other announcement on Friday other than 100% distance learning. Those school districts around us, PG County, in my conversation with Mayor Bowser, the very first, when she was about to make her announcement last Thursday, I reminded her that 40% of our teachers live in PG County. 62% of them reported having underlying health conditions. And her response and the Chancellor's response was absolutely, totally inappropriate. She knows that, and of course, we've taken necessary steps to respond to that in several ways. What I want you to know is we do have capacity and authority about what decision, is, how schools are going to open in the fall. The Chancellor's monthly meeting with me was yesterday. I asked him if I could invite the former DC commissioner for health, Reed Tuxen. He didn't, he didn't object, he came. And what Reed shared with the Chancellor were all of the scientific facts as to why our schools cannot possibly open for in-person learning in the fall. He talked about community spread, contact tracing, ventilation. And, and Dr. Tuxen has, even though he is no longer the health commissioner here in DC, he has all of the data on our schools. I reported to Chancellor Furby that the chemical that is being used to clean the buses is causing a horrible reaction for people with asthma. Many of our students and teachers have asthma and will be using that transportation. So given all of that information, the information we shared in our reopen task force report coming from teachers who are truly the experts on why we need to open 100% virtually. And, and teachers have already expressed 
their desire to get back to in-person teaching. Mm -hmm. The fact that they were able to do distance learning after four days of preparing says that they are passionate, dedicated, commit, committed professionals. But at this time, there is no way Mayor Bowser or Chancellor Furby can justify opening schools in the fall, knowing what has been reported to them, knowing what teachers have said, and basically hearing what parents are saying. Mm -hmm. They're not trusting that these schools are gonna be ready to receive students or teachers based on their historical memory and also based on ours as teachers. And this is not a game of Russian roulette where we're gonna be used to test drive the a, a plan that the mayor or the chancellor decides to do. And of course, uh, we'll be at the press conference. The wall, uh, this, this month alone, I attended four funerals. Three of them in person, four. One yesterday virtual for a teacher. Another one, a teacher from Merch last week. And to be honest with you, and I heard LaJoy and I heard others talking about, this is not a time for the mayor to use teachers and students as one parent referred to as guinea pigs. And that's a horrible phrase, but that is exactly what, what parents and teachers and, and communities feeling. And I do believe that we have support of parents who do know that we want to perfect distance learning. This time should be spent preparing to reopen with distance learning in the fall, handling all of those constraints, all of those challenges that teachers felt during the distance learning period with students not having devices. This is a time when we need to get that right. Find the $11 million for the computers that are needed for students to do that. Provide the professional development for teachers to get distance learning right, Hire, even if it means hiring an expert on distance learning. This is something new for public schools and we can get it right. Teachers want to get it right, but opening schools in the fall, when parents are expressing outrage and fear, teachers are expressing outrage and fear is simply basic to, to do anything other than what we have talked about on this call would basically say, I don't really care about the students or the, or the teachers. And so the mayor's announcement on Friday, we will be there in full force. We'll be in Freedom Plaza. And we may be back at her house. But the message is going to be consistently, mm -hmm. there is nowhere, in, nothing you can announce on Friday other than 100% distance learning. I want to thank all of you for joining us here today. Um, we have a great series of events that Tina has shared with you. And I want to thank the organizing committee again for the activities that they're planning, uh, depending on the, uh, the status of health indicators and ultimately the mayor's decision on Friday, we'll reevaluate re our next midweek and consider further events. But these events and activities and the pressure are going to continue throughout the summer until we get the right answer. So thank you for joining us. We look forward to hearing you again. And the fact that you again came out on a Sunday let me know and others know how passionate you are about this issue. And I want to thank those elected officers from the state board, Janice, for joining us. I look forward to uh, seeing you all again on Friday for those of you who are there. Tina, thank you and others. Thank you, Liz. And I just wanted to say, I, I, last week I was remiss in not mentioning uh, some of our executive board members that were on the call. And I noticed that there are some today. I, I, don't know, I don't want to go in and start calling out names, but I know I saw there, there's Laura. She's the behind, behind the scenes person. Okay. And I know I saw Steve somewhere around in here. Uh, and I know I saw Kimberlyn's name, but I just wanted to just shout them out. And I think I saw, I, I want to say I saw Sarah also, but I just wanted to shout, shout out some of our dynamic executive board members. Yeah. Uh, again, I'm not, I don't want to upstage you, Liz, because you had the final word, but I just wanted to throw that out there. And I want to say thank you so much to everyone. You can unmute yourself and you can say thank you. You can give shouts out. You can do whatever you want to do. But I would just want to say thank you for coming. And it's been a blessing to me as well as to everyone else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Be safe. Bye, everybody. Y'all be safe. Bye, everybody. 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 Bye, everybody.
Have yes, a good day. Lisa. Tina. Thank you, Tina. Be safe, everyone. Thank you so much, Tina. Thank we love you. Love you. Thank so you. Much. Love you back. Thank you, Tina. <laughs> You're welcome, Marcus. You know, we, we just see each other like this, right? Right. Too <laughs> often. Right. See y'all uh, soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Madam President. <laughs> All right, guys.